campaigning for women's safety against men's violence for uh, a number of years and, and, and also in terms of some of the work that I did when I was still in policing. So it felt like a logical extension of that work. But what I really noticed was that um, there wasn't really a conversation. It tended to be an incident, a response to an incident, um, discussion on social media or polarized positions on social media, rather than bringing people together from disparate walks of life who are experts in male violence, um, in supporting female victims and experts in policing. So people inside and outside of policing and getting to them together in a chaired and facilitated, facilitated meeting uh, where they could be open, where we could have a constructive but challenging conversation about um, this really fundamental issue of misogyny and policing and how it manifests in terms of male violence in policing and what we could do about it. And so the idea always was to come forward with ultimately a report at the end of the series, but with some recommendations, some ideas, maybe an affirmation of existing ones, maybe some new ideas um, that could be you know, more fully explored through the process of these conversations. And so far, you haven't completed all of the sessions yet, but are there any key emerging themes or some surprising thoughts or ideas that have already sort of come across? There are a whole raft of ideas and thoughts that have already come out of the conversations, and I'm sure there will be a host more still to come. Um, one of the ones that's profoundly um, struck me was about what do we want from our police officers in the 21st century? What skills are really important, particularly for frontline officers? Um, and how do they match up against the existing competency and values framework that policing is supposed to recruit, promote and reward um, through? Um, and particularly around um, the value, the competency, call it what you make, but of empathy. Because empathy is, I think, underrated. It's certainly never been measured, it's never been used in policing to the best of my knowledge as a measurement, as a metric um, for selection at any point in, a, in an officer's career. And given that for frontline officers, probably at least a third, maybe half of the violent crime they attend will be domestic abuse, uh, let alone the number of missing people that they deal with, it, vulnerable people in a whole range of scenarios. And actually we've missed, policing has missed, um, something that I think could fundamentally reshape um, who it is we recruit and how we recruit, and again, then reward and recognize. So you talk about empathy. The difficulty though, I guess with policing is that of course you need empathy to deal with victims and people in the most awful situations. But you also, sometimes, you have to be pretty hard-nosed, don't you? You have to be pretty tough. You have to go in hard sometimes. You have to act quickly. And sometimes that means, you, you know, if you're going to the scene, you've got to get people out the way. You've got to go straight there. And it's that kind of collision between those two sort of attributes that might be quite difficult. I think it could be what I'm not saying is empathy at the expense of everything actually it's about how you build that into the mix so I would and used to say when I was an officer is probably the most important criteria I thought was about resilience because it doesn't matter what level of policing you operate in it's tough you know whether you're operating at the top the middle you know whether you're a frontline officer whether you're a specialist um, whether you're a response officer whether you're a student officer you know your resilience is tested every day in ways that you cannot conceive um, frequently. And, and, and for many of us, we actually don't want to conceive the sort of ways that officers are tested. So I think it's about how you look at it in the round. But actually, I think it doesn't matter whether you're a firearms officer, whether you're a public order specialist, or whether you're a neighborhood beat officer, if those things still exist in, in these, this day and age, Actually, there is something about 
remembering those core principles of humanity of which empathy, compassion, diligence are really powerful. And they're very powerful anti-corrupting um, criteria, if that makes sense. They're really protective. Um, and that's what's important about how I think policing almost reinvents itself in terms of what it says it wants and how it wants its officers to behave not just to the public to fulfill its contract of policing by consent, but also to, to their colleagues. So in order to get to a point where that's recognized more, I mean, have your discussions led you into the sort of point where you think that we need a Royal Commission on Policing, which is what everyone's calling for, or does it not have to be as radical or as far reaching as that, which could take years and years and years? I think there is a consensus that it needs to be a statutory public inquiry uh, and that the current um, reviews, inquiries, don't have the sort of powers that, or the scope, to be honest, that are required. But absolutely, this isn't about kicking the can down the road, which sometimes inquiries can be. Uh, there's an awful lot, I think, that's starting to emerge. You know, some of it which policing already knows, but also because of this series, we're bringing together a range of people from outside of policing who are bringing different ideas in. So, for example, about how the professional standards um, capability and capacity could be improved around both victim and indeed for perpetrators so that they're absolutely held to account, um, but they're held to account faster, which is always a bone of contention in terms of of the process and also about how victims are supported and those who are blowing the whistle because whilst policing has policies, processes, you know, frameworks, it doesn't necessarily follow up in terms of behaviours and so whilst it might say it has a whistleblowing policy and that's fine and it might offer support, it doesn't do what that victim or that whistleblower needs in terms of providing the right and appropriate, which is, can be different in lots of different cases, um, yet that right support for that individual to come forward and to see through what is an incredibly difficult um, process to go through emotionally as well as physically and when it's drawn out over long periods, that's really challenging. So listening to people who work their area of specialities around victims or indeed perpetrators yeah, and how risks um, of police perpetrators are now being recognised and there is academic um, rigour behind that. Actually, how can police forces use that information, use that evidence base to proactively work and to root out those people who um, have the wrong behaviours, often have criminal behaviours, um, and do the service no good but most importantly utterly fail the public. Do you think um, finally from the discussions you've had so far and presumably other conversations as you set up these these panels and so on do you think that there is an appetite for reform or is this just going to be a moment that everyone talks a lot and discusses the need for change and actually other priorities take over in six months or a year's time What's your, what's your sense? Well, I think the need for momentum, I think, is absolutely critical. And it felt a little bit um, at the end of the autumn, going towards the end of last year, end of 2021, that momentum might have sort of slipped. And that was one of the big things, again, behind the series and about what we could do in the future as well with policing TV um, on this particular agenda, because whilst policing faces a whole range of different threats and significant risks, this is one of them. But actually, this is one, if not the one, certainly one of the most significant, that fundamentally challenges the legitimacy of policing in this country. And is, unless those both in government with political leadership and those with policing leadership can actually seize the moment, then that contract between the police and the public you know, isn't just broken, it's shattered. And 
the model of policing that is seen and revered and has been revered worldwide uh, will be gone forever. And that's not somewhere that I think, um, you know, that I would want, I would want for our country or our police service. So I think that's really a challenge for our PCCs, um, government and indeed opposition parties, but also very much for our police leadership at every level. So this isn't just about police chiefs, this is about the Superintendents Association and very much this is about the Police Federation and every member, I would say, of policing because I think every person in policing is and can be a leader at any one time. Sometimes they are more consistently than others, but absolutely every constable is a leader in their own right and they need to step up. Sue Fish, thank you very much indeed. We look forward to seeing the series. Thank you.